My first question is, why is effective political and civilian control of the military essential to democracy? Well, um, it's, a, that's a, it's a great question, and civilian control of the military is a rather obscure concept for a lot of people. If you walk out on the street here in the U.S., uh, into, in a town, and you ask someone about civilian control of the military, they won't understand what, what that really means. And I think they would take objection to that term, saying civilian control of the military. Because not understanding how that fits into a democracy, I think the first instinct for most people is that um, why should we control the military? In the United States, you know, the military is very uh, revered, they're very well considered, they're looked up to. And so the idea that civilians should control them is something I think that strikes most Americans as strange. They don't understand it. Um, and that's okay. Uh, you know, uh, you can't understand everything, but but what we really are talking about here, as you raise with your question, is um, how democracy, at least how the United States practices that, how that democracy is um, uh, is undertaken. How does how does it work in terms of uh, of guaranteeing what democracy is, which is. Um, one person, one vote, and that the people decide how they're going to be governed. Uh, in its very basic form, um, that the people will vote, and the people will vote in a government. Uh, they'll vote in a leader, uh, and um, and and through their voting, through that voters process, um, they will dictate that 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 government within the confines of the Constitution. Um, and, and part of that, of course, is that, uh, or the major part of that, is that we're going to be led by those people who are elected. And, of course, the military is not elected. Um, the military, um, uh, as well as civil servants and foreign service officers, they're servants of the state. Uh, so they serve those who are elected. Um, and uh, and in, in, in some forms of government and some forms of democracy, um, a a a uh, an institution or some other aspect of that country sometimes holds as much power as that elected official. Um, and in the past, we've seen, and in the American in the American history, if you go back to the days of the Revolutionary War and when we were a colony of Great Britain, um, the military held a lot of sway. Um, and we certainly saw that in the communist days. We've seen that in other totalitarian governments where um, uh, sometimes the military holds an outsized power in terms of dictating what, the, what happens to the people or dictating what the government decides. They have a thumb on the scale, if you will. Um, and as we've put together our democracy and how we try to ensure um, the, uh, that the people's will is exercised through their votes is we have to make sure that all aspects of government, including the military, including the foreign service, including the civil service, uh, the various organs of government, that we all are there to serve the people and we serve the people through those uh, uh, representatives who are voted in. And uh, that part of the democracy that has guns <laughs> And can be very influential. Cannot be allowed to put their their thumb on the scale and so thwart what the um, what in, the, in our case what the American people have voted. So we have adopted over time uh, both laws, but also in practice that um, the military uh, is there to do the will of the commander in chief, and that's the president of the United States, and that president is elected by the people. So, so the military, in fact. Uh, has to fulfill the guidance provided by the president. That's a long answer, I know, but it's a complicated one. Yeah, thank you. What are the essential elements of the civilian control? Well, that's a that's an interesting point, and uh, I think the essential elements of civilian control of the military is that. Um, uh, You know, there's there's some very practical and uh, and and legal aspects of that, but there are also some that are not something that you can point to like a law. Uh, 
but instead is something that um, is adopted by the military themselves as well as civilians in terms of how they how they uh, take in what those laws are, or what those traditions are, what the what the importance is as far as the democracy. So, in terms of an essential element, I think an essential element uh, has to be that understanding, uh, that adoption, that um, internalizing by the military of civilian control, and how that can best be fulfilled by the military. Um, there is there, there's there's tradition certainly that goes in with that, but there's also um, uh, an understanding among the military about um, how far they go in terms of even talking about politics or even voting. Uh, there are traditions, there are ways within the military where, where they approach politics in a very much a handoff way. That changes over time, it changes by generation, it changes by practice. Recently, a lot of retired military have been much more vocal than they might have been in the past. We've had a, a general who was recently retired become the Secretary of Defense, which is a, a political job. It's one that represents the president and is usually fulfilled by a civilian, usually. Um, and so in terms of tradition and in terms of how we approach civilian control of the military, that was pushing the boundaries a little bit. I mean, the, the, the laws and policies were, um, were, uh, were followed in terms of getting congressional waivers and that type of thing for General Mattis in this case. But it's something that was unusual and that a lot of people were a little worried about, that what did that mean? Uh, could this happen as well as having a retired general be head of Health and Human Services, uh, rather Homeland Security, rather, in, in the administration, or to have um, the, the chief of staff be a retired general and, and have a president, the commander-in-chief, Refer to his to refer to the military as his generals and this type of thing. It that this recent administration has tested a lot of these, um, a lot of the ways in which the military particularly could hold themselves apart from the political process, and the political process too tries to keep at arm's length the military and have a very proper relationship there. But there's also laws that govern, you know, what can happen there. And and I think certainly one of the most important elements is this is the idea in, in the Constitution that the, um, the President of the United States is the commander-in-chief of the military. So you've got to have a chain of command between the civilian leadership and the military that's very specific. So there's no question about um, who's in charge. Um, and so that's something that um, as an element you've got to have that uh, just to begin with uh, and then uh, tradition and practice and, ad and additional legislation fall uh, from that and uh, but it's something that the elements um, as strong as they may be um, it's something you can't take for granted uh, you know, there's the, the, the idea of a coup and the American sense of the military taking over is something that is very far-fetched. We would never think of that happening. But you can't always take that for granted. People are people. Uh, and even in a democracy, um, things can happen that are unimaginable just a few years before. So the, um, the, you, you can't always assume that those elements that might have been put into place years ago are still going to hold true as generations change and as governments change and, and the way in which we practice democracy changes. So, um, so this, this element, and particularly the chain of command, led by the civilians, um, not just by the president, but the, the people that the president puts into political positions within the bureaucracy, uh, including within the military, the secretary of the army, the secretary of the navy, the secretary of the air force, they're civilians. Um, and so you had, so in terms of the process, the practice, the bureaucratic structure that's put in there, that's an element of this too, because that's how a commander in chief can exercise that civilian control, is through those political appointees uh, who are civilians, and, and they in turn get their guidance from the president, and they turn to the military, whether it's Army, Navy, Air Force, uh, and they um, and they make sure that the president's uh, guidance is carried out by the services, as well as by the office of the Secretary of Defense, and that's that civilian 
um, group that are surround the secretary that's make sure that the secretary's uh, guidance uh, civilian guidance is, is made into policies that then the services carry out so so what so the main elements starting off with that um, the, that chain of command the secretary of defense the the the, the, uh, the uh, political appointee bureaucracy carrying out the secretary's guidance um, and his his or her guidance in turn is provided by the commander in chief the president of the united states a civilian so so as an as an element the chain of command the political appointee bureaucracy the civilian bureaucracy to carry this out and then as i said the um within the military this understanding of their role and how that role is, is exercised how they can keep themselves as pure as you can from politics and carrying out what the president wants carried out. Okay, what do you think uh, of the process of the establishment of political and civilian control of the Hungarian military after the regime change in 989? Well, I was very much, you know, trying to help that as best we could and it, it's a it's an important story, and I think the fact that Hungary was included in the first three new NATO members says that Hungary made quite a, a um, quite good pros a progress in readying itself to be a NATO member. And part of that was not just NATO interoperability, but also the, the structures, the institutions within the Hungarian government that supported democracy. And of course, civilian control of the military was part of that. And so, um, you know, for Hungary and, the, and Czechoslovakia, as it was at the time, and Poland, and, uh, and the nations uh, coming out of the Warsaw Pact, it was a big job. Um, and just speaking of Hungary, uh, certainly there was um, traditions and laws and ways of structuring the Hungarian military that dated from the Warsaw Pact days and from working with the Soviet Union. But but even before um, the time of of the Warsaw Pact, uh, you had the uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire. You had the long, long history of Hungary and the Hungarian military and how that was structured and why it was structured that way and the relationship between the Hungarian military and the um, and the civilian forms of government that that get came uh, to pass during the the time of Hungarian history so by the time we got to 1989 1990 1991 there was a lot of baggage there the Hungarian military had that they had to sort through because as we looked at new members of NATO um, we were looking for the new members that uh, were not only going down the road of, of interoperability in terms of equipment but also going down the road in terms of civilian control of the military market economy structuring the Hungarian government itself to look more like the counterparts in Western Europe because as we felt that as we sat around the table at NATO uh, with with allies, new allies, uh, that we wanted to have them uh, have the new allies uh, look look like us um, in terms of the older members of NATO in terms of government as much as we could, and that was hard uh, for the Hungarian military, particularly. I was involved in the NATO interoperability portion of it. Uh, Frank Kramer was our Assistant Secretary of Defense, and he took very much to heart uh, getting Hungary and the other two nations ready uh, militarily. Uh, and, uh, and so we focused on things like uh, developing a, a non-commissioned officers corps, the NCOs. Uh, as you know, in the Soviet style, there weren't that many NCOs. Junior officers did a lot of things that the sergeants and others would have done uh, today. And so, so looking at the Hungarian military and talking about restructuring to that degree uh, was something we felt was important because that also helped to underpin civilian control was to have a bureaucracy that where you had non-commissioned officers, commissioned officers, uh, and and going through schooling and going through. Um, new ways of thinking that kind of respected the understanding that on top of that military structure would be a minister of defense. And that minister of defense would have civilians around him or her 
um, where uh, they would reflect, as we were talking about earlier, they would reflect what the prime minister and what the parliament and what the Hungarian people wanted. Um, and, and that was something that you had to have a bureaucracy, a military bureaucracy, to understand and to support and to understand their role in that. Um, and part of that role, I, I think this is a great example, is the importance of transparency among the, to the Hungarian people. And what I mean by that is, um, in the West, by that up to that time, and we're still working on this, we tried to have transparency in the form of a public affairs officer. Someone within the Pentagon, say, for the United States, a public affairs officer who would um, who would present to the public um, that transparency on what the military was doing, what had happened, if there was a problem, if there was a, an advance somewhere, if there was a military operation, that there, that there needed to be transparency and a communication back and forth between not just the civilian leadership but also the people and the military structure. And so that wasn't a feature for many of the, uh, the new allies coming out of the Warsaw Pact. The military were in a black box. There wasn't a Minister of Defense necessarily. There wasn't a Ministry of Defense. They, there certainly wasn't the structures that included something like a public affairs office. So what we did was um, we offered to Hungary and to the other new allies come to the Pentagon and sit with our public affairs office and see how they go about doing it and see if there's some things you can adapt for your Ministry of Defense. Because by this point in Budapest, they were building a Ministry of Defense, appointing a Minister of Defense, and there needed to be a spokesperson. And there needed to be an office to support that spokesperson. And a relationship between the military and that civilian spokesperson. So, so we were trying to show how we go at we go about doing it, uh, and then, uh, and but, but what we did not want to do is impose on Hungary what we do. I used to tell my Hungarian counterparts that if you all build a Ministry of Defense that's in the shape of a Pentagon, I said that would make me very sad because, because what we do is what we're still working on in terms of how the U.S. operates. For Hungary, it'll be different, uh, and uh, so we're showing you ideas and ways in which we do it that you might be able to uh, adopt uh, and adapt for your own use. Other allies did the same thing, the Brits and, and others. And so that was an example of, in those early days, what we did to try to help build the institutions and the relationships and the roles and role models that are helpful in civilian control of the military, of that aspect of running a democracy. And um, we did it not just with public affairs, of course, we did it with planning, uh, and uh, we did it with uh, budgets. Uh, how do you do a budget? How do you make it transparent? How do you have a budget for the, uh, for the Hungarian military um, that meets what the Hungarian military says it needs, but then is approved by the civilian authorities, including the parliament? Uh, in the past, the Hungarian military didn't necessarily have that many eyes watching it. Uh, it didn't have that kind of transparency between the Hungarian people and the Hungarian military on how that money was being spent and why it was being requested. That's something that at NATO is, the, is what NATO is all about. It's not well known, but one of the important parts about NATO is that all the nations who are part of the alliance their defense budgets are transparent and everyone has a copy of it and NATO helps shape what allies buy and how they structure their military, not just for interoperability, but it also helps to enshrine civilian control as part of it. The alliance has a role to play in that. And so um, for the Hungarian military or the Czech military or any others, that's a very new thing. And it's a very imperfect thing because budgeting is very hard and the politics behind budgeting is very hard. And that's where you have civilians on the one hand who control things, civilian control of the military, and the military who say, we need these things. I need that money. And, this, and you must give it to me. And the civilians say, no, we, we've decided we want that money to go into schools. And so you have this back and forth, and that's what the democracy is all about, and that's what how civilian control of the military works. And it's very imperfect, and it's very frustrating. I have, it's frustrating for us, too. No one has, does it in exactly the right way. It's always a, you know, money is always the root of a lot of arguments. And, uh, and so those are the kinds of things in those early days. 
as we were working and building a bilateral relationship with Hungary and as we were working getting Hungary ready to go into NATO is it was a bit of a shock is trying to say these are some of the things that help a um, help uh, in terms of a democracy and helps the civilian control of the military portion of that and you're not used to that to the Hungarian military this isn't something you're used to this is, isn't something you've probably ever seen uh, and and it's something that's not pleasant but this is what we all do and we do this at NATO too so and and so it's off we went and the Hungarian military and the civilian government structure of the Hungarian defense establishment uh, jumped right into it and off we went okay could you tell me uh, what exactly was your job in supporting this process? Well, in um, in about 1993, um, well, I guess I need to start by saying in the Pentagon, uh, there are regional offices uh, that support the Secretary of Defense. There's a Middle East office, an Asia office, and there's Europe office. And back in those days, when I was a young man, young civil servant, I was uh, running the Scandinavia part of the Europe office. In the Europe office, you had desk officers in charge of the UK or France or Italy. And I was in charge of uh, the Scandinavian bilateral defense relationship. So with Sweden and Norway, Denmark, um, I was in charge of the day-to-day running of that bilateral U.S. to Sweden, U.S. to Finland defense relationship. Exercises and training and visits by ministers or that kind of thing. And in about 1992, 1993, um, as NATO, uh, two, two things happened. One was NATO enlargement became accepted. And the second thing was the U.S. realized that we needed to build what we really didn't have with Hungary in this case, which was a def defense relationship with you. And uh, and so uh, up until a year or two before, you were the adversaries. And it sounds so strange to say that, uh, but, um, but that was the case. And the Warsaw Pact ended after the Cold War slowed down and the Soviet Union went away. And we didn't have a Hungary desk officer. We didn't have a relationship with your military, except pointing guns at each other, I guess. And um, so that had to go away. And so my job as a young man, uh, they said, We're, you no longer work on the Scandinavia. Why don't you do Central Europe? Work with some of the others, and, um, and you have some countries to follow as well, and begin to build our defense relationship with Central Europe. And so I did that, and the countries I followed particularly um, included Hungary. I think your first minister was Minister Kelly, I think, if, if that's the right name. But uh, And so we began to build on a bilateral basis programs to get you ready for NATO membership, but also programs to strengthen the bilateral bond between our defense establishment and your defense establishment, the, the, the Department of Defense and the Ministry of Defense, our military with your military. We got to know each other. Uh, our European command uh, in Stuttgart was very important in this. Um, and, um, and so we had all kinds of programs that we would fund. I was in charge of um, $100 million every year. I, I had $100 million that I could uh, yeah, you know, talk to our attaches and, and I could give out to um, fund bilateral programs uh, so that um, um, we could get your military structure, particularly NATO interoperable radars that were NATO interoperable, communications that were NATO interoperable, training. I mentioned the, the uh, non-commissioned officers corps, the NCOs. Uh, we began to have exchanges where your military came to visit our military and to see how we did the uh, non-commissioned officers. And so the Hungarian military was faced with the issue of making an officer, a young officer, uh, a sergeant. Suddenly, you know, all of a sudden they dropped from being an officer to be a non-commissioned officer. And, and so that was a bit of a revolution. And, and also many of the nations coming out of the Warsaw Pact were top-heavy with lots of generals. And we said, well, you know, uh, you probably need more, less chiefs and more Indians. You know, you need, you need to slim that. You know. And so here we were giving advice to Hungary, but again, stressing that this is something that you have to adapt, you know, to your traditions. 
um, a lot of the equipment that Hungary had was, of course, Soviet, and that wasn't um, compatible with the West. And in an alliance, you needed to have the same kind of ammunition. This, uh, you needed to have a lot of things that were very similar and could work together. And so we began to figure out what did Hungary really need right now. Um, Hungary needed to be able to handle classified information. That sounds simple, but it's not. And it's something where before Hungary came into NATO, if you were given a NATO classified document, you needed to know how to handle it. What the classification levels were, how you would store certain classified information, uh, and that type of thing. And so we discovered that towards the very end as you were, as Hungary was approaching uh, becoming a member, we realized that, that that we didn't do it the same way. And that to ensure the security of our classified information, you all needed to have, you know, facilities like safes and things. So that was another angle uh, of, of how we worked with you all to get you not just NATO compatible as we began NATO enlargement, but also to build that bilateral relationship between the United States and Hungary. So, Okay, my next question. Uh, what were the most difficult problems you had to uh, confront in this issue and how you managed it? Uh, what the most difficult problem concerning uh, civilian control of the military or just generally? Both. Okay. Uh, wh what I would say is that um, probably expectations in terms of what NATO expected or the U.S. Congress expected or what the Hungarian people or the Hungarian government expected from one another. There was a time when a lot of the um, former Warsaw Pact countries expected us, like the Soviet Union, to give equipment, uh, like airplanes and things. And, and of course, we, 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 we do give equipment away sometimes, but it's usually something that has to be purchased. And I think that is something that was a, an awakening for a lot of the new allies was that, um, you know, where's the, you know, where's the, 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 you know, the support in terms of equipment and this type of thing. And I said, well, it's just not the way, no one, no one does that within NATO. And so I think there was a realization that in terms of Hungarian military modernization, uh, in terms of Hungarian integration and interoperability with NATO, that this was going to take a long, long time. That we couldn't just hand to the Hungarian Air Force U.S. F-16s. Uh, this was something that ha would have to come in time because the Hungarian military was already going through a very tough process of reorganizing itself from top to bottom and the idea that we could just hand you sophisticated equipment and expect the Hungarian military to be able to absorb it and use it is just that no one would be able to do that. We couldn't do that. So that was one of the hard things to start off with. It was more mental. It was more the expectations of that we had for you and you had for us. And I think we all realized that uh, we had to be patient with one another and we had to know that this is going to be a long-term generational thing, that it wasn't going to happen overnight. Uh, and that was, that was the one thing that was important. Um, the second thing that was important was in terms of the Hungarian institutions, um, whether it was how Hungary was going to structure its democracy, how it was going to structure the Ministry of Defense, how it was going to structure the military, we had to be patient there too. Uh, we couldn't come in and expect um, uh, miracles overnight, and I think the, Hungar the Romanians actually, it was Romania that that was had a very a very good sense of humor about this and after about a year or two of this kind of working together uh, and reform and restructuring they used to give everyone a, a mug you know coffee mug and the coffee mug was a regular mug but the handle instead of being on the outside the handle was on the inside and they said you know this was they're that they're, they're trying they're, they're you know they're they're almost there you know so they had this mug as a example of they're not perfect but they're getting there and i think that kind of attitude was something we all had to have which is um this was going to take time so um you know, there were. Uh, there, this is more of a State Department thing, more of a civilian thing. So it's not so much DoD necessarily. But there was corruption, you know, in terms of procuring equipment. Uh, there were problems in how, in the planning and budgeting for procuring things. Uh, there, um, there, there was confusion on what the priority should be. 
I think you probably are going to interview Frank Kramer. I hope you do. He really led an effort to try to, to spend a lot of time with Hungary uh, and other allies too and work out what the priority should be and why. And how do you decide on your own what the priority should be instead of the U.S. coming in and telling you? There was this legacy from the Soviet Union where the Soviets would come in and say, look, this is what we want you to do. Here's the equipment. There's the front line. That's where the NATO is. That's going to be your target. You know, there wasn't a lot of, of give and take um, between Hungary and the Hungarian military and the Soviet Union. It was the Red Army. You were just a, an appendage to the Red Army, uh, and you were told what to do. So in the West, of course, we have to determine that ourselves. NATO doesn't really come in and tell you anything. NATO will give you – NATO has force goals and they, NATO has things they want you to try to do. They negotiate that with you and at the end of the day, if you can't do it, that's your call. NATO is not going to tell you what to do. And the United States is not going to tell you what to do. So it's not the Soviet system. But um, what happened was that um, there was confusion in Budapest because it was like, well, NATO wants us to do this. You Americans have suggested we do this, and the British have come in last week and they said this. And so there was a constant try, there was a constant uh, uh, deconfliction that had to be done so that we all decided together what the priority should be. Uh, and, um, and so so there were things like that. Um, uh, and uh, um, and I th so I think just to just to be you know strategic about it and at thirty thousand feet looking at the issues there were a lot of other little things but but really the the the, the biggest thing was the patience and the expectations so that we wouldn't disappoint one another so that we didn't want Hungary to come to us and go you know we'd rather be in the Warsaw Pact this is too hard you 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 know we're not ready for this we didn't want to have that kind of response so we were in this together we had to be patient. We had to understand that, um, um, that this was going to be a 20 or 30 year project, but it was really important. I guess one more point is, you know, no one had done this before. I mean, the fall of the Berlin Wall and then the end of the Cold War and the, just the, 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 um, the um, you know, the disappearance of the Warsaw Pact and all of a sudden us becoming, we, no one, that was a surprise for everyone. And we're all really happy about that. It was a, a tremendous time of jubilation, and, um, but that didn't know we knew what the next step should be. So we were making it up all along as you guys were too, but we did it together and that was the most important. We didn't dictate to you, you didn't dictate to us. We worked this together um, and I think we had to really come to understand that and be patient with it. Okay, I have one more question to you. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you know of the current situation in Hungary? Well, um, you know, uh, I, I, I know quite a bit about it, um, and uh, it's something that all of us are, um, you know, you're, for me, just speaking for myself, there's some disappointment in terms of how the politics have gone um, in, um, in Hungary in terms of the media, in terms of the judiciary, in terms of... Uh, of, of how politics is practiced, um, uh, the civil society, you know, uh, the role of the civil society, you know, when we were talking about civilian control of the military and the essential elements, I was talking about the essential elements of, of a democracy anyway, and those are essential element: a strong judiciary, uh, rule of law, um, the importance of, of the press uh, and um, and the press being able to blow the whistle on something that, that they were seeing right or wrong you know they might have gotten it absolutely wrong as well but the, but the press as a watchdog is, is important um, with the idea that in, that you've got to have an informed people the people have to understand the issues and the politicians and the policies and the problems that the politicians face in order to make an informed judgment when they vote. That's just critical. And so these are all critical elements of making sure there's an informed uh, citizenry. But you know, here in the United States, you know, we have our own problems too. Uh, and uh, and so, the, so the American people right now, I think, are getting a very good lesson on just what you're asking about, which is a democracy and asking about the important elements of a democracy. For us, 
we've got to have a strong press too. And you have the President of the United States attacking the press. And it's not that the press hasn't been attacked by other presidents too, but this attacking is pretty vicious. Uh, you have um, complaints about the judiciary here too. Um, and um, and how that the that there seems to be um, some uh, unfair uh, practices by the, our Senate uh, with when the, when there was a vacancy on the Supreme Court when Obama was the president and this Republican held Senate said well we're not going to vote on it until the election and I mean it was um, you can read all about that you don't need to hear me talk about it but the, I guess the point I want to make here is that. No democracy has has got it right 100%. Um, democracies are can be very it can be a very ugly process. It's a very messy process. Uh, it's something that when you have the will of the people expressed and the the, the people themselves aren't participating in the democracy they don't care about the, the or they are so susceptible to manipulation through social media we saw that with our presidential election um, so there are problems in all the democracies with ensuring that you are structuring your democracy you're exercising your right to vote you're doing all the things that that must be done right to make a democracy work we're all having problems with that and it's just the nature of things. Uh, if you if you could have something that's a little simpler, and that's having a totalitarian government, Mussolini, <laughs> oh Stalin. I mean, there's a lot of examples out there of totalitarians who um, who are essentially telling the people what they're going to do, including the military. And there's always trouble that comes from that. So a democracy like a marriage is something you have to work on every day, every day, and it's a struggle, and it's not fun all the time. But I think to date, this is the best form that we've been able to come up with. So when you look at what hunger, what's happening in Hungary or Poland or some uh, some other, um, some of the other nations too, um, look at look at London. Look at what's happening with Brexit and and what the, you know, Boris Johnson's doing. Um, it's hard. This is hard. Uh, so I can sit here and say I'm frustrated by some of the things that I'm, I've seen happen in Budapest. Uh, you know, I'm frustrated by my own government too. So I think all of us have to just be aware of the importance of our role in democracy and our role to be frustrated and our role to do something about that. And that's, that's being informed about issues and that's voting. I will tell you here in the United States among Democrats, including myself, we've become much more political than we were. I think we took for granted a lot of um, the U.S. democracy, the U.S. voting process, the U.S. Po political process. We, particularly myself as a civil servant and then as a political appointee myself with Obama, um, we just assume that, uh, you know, others can take care of that. I have to focus on the government and I have to focus on the Pentagon and building relationships with Hungary. Um, but I can't. That was wrong. I was wrong. You can't take that for granted. So I write checks now for political uh, candidates. I help political candidates. Um, and uh, and so for us, for Democrats particularly, but across the U.S., I think all of us have awakened to the important role that we play in making sure that we try to get democracy as right as we can. So really, at the end of the day, it's up to the Hungarian people. Um, you know, you, you, you get what you pay for, as they say. You you get what you vote for, um, and if there is unhappiness there with how democracy is being carried out, then it's got to be expressed in the voting booth, just like it is here in the United States, just like it's it's going to be in the UK. So, um, so there you go.